Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's session. My name is Jackie Gifford, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure, joining you here from New York City. Travel and tourism continue to face enormous logistical and economic headwinds, with some 40% of jobs vanishing here in the United States alone. What policies, practices, and partnerships are needed to reopen borders and enable essential travel, tourism, and commerce in a safe and sustainable way? Today, we are here to discuss how to restore cross-border mobility and reinvigorate the economy with four key stakeholders. So joining me for a panel discussion are Paul Meyer, the CEO of the Commons Project Foundation, Joanna Garrity, the President and Chief Operating Officer of JetBlue, Patty Haju, the Minister of Health for Canada, and Luis Felipe de Oliveira, the Director General of Airports Council International. Before we get to our panelists, though, I'm going to just do a few little notes for housekeeping. The Prime Minister of Aruba, Evelyn Weber Cruz, will be joining us for introductory remarks. We're then going to hand it back over to the panelists for a discussion. At the half hour mark, we're going to be moving, moving to a closed door session and Q&A with the forum members. I'm asking you to please stay logged on. You don't need to log out to join the session. And you can ask questions from the chat function. You can raise your hand. We're all really excited to talk to you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the Prime Minister for her remarks. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your kind introduction and to the World Economic Forum to bring attention on restoring the cross-border travel, especially now. Aruba is an autonomous country within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. We are known as one happy island and we are a major tourist destination in the Caribbean. We embrace the developments in secure digitization of, travel, of the travel process, and we are at the forefront of seamless and contactless passenger facilitation ever since the launching of the Aruba Happy Flow in 2015. Part of our economic and innovation recovery plan is to continue to create a safe, a healthy, and a trusted environment for our visitors and our citizens. Aruba is actively rethinking and innovating in areas such as e-government, cybersecurity, and digital identity, to name a few. And this is a part of our larger recovery and renewed, with a renewed focus on greater economic resilience. The Common Trust Network is a groundbreaking initiative of the World Economic Forum and the Commons Project Foundation and this fits in Aruba's innovative approach towards bouncing forward. The Common Pass is a secure choice for our travelers, allowing for rapid, accessible, verified, and trusted sharing of digital health data of the COVID-19 test results. Increasing the passenger's feeling of safety by minimizing contact and ease of use and facilitating the flow of arrival upon destination by adhering to interoperable standards as well as data privacy rules and regulations. And finally, ensuring trust and transparency to our travelers. For Aruba specifically, we continue welcoming travelers that can provide proof of a negative test taken 72 hours prior to departure. And alternatively, upon arrival, passengers are able to conduct a PCR rapid test with results provided within 24 hours. In our government's continuing efforts to provide the most safe, seamless, and coordinated travel experience possible, all necessary facilities and procedures are in place for any visitor needing to take a COVID-19 test while in Aruba as a requirement for re-entry to their country of origin. Aruba is pleased to be the first country to join this initiative to soon pilot the Common Pass as a choice for passengers on the JetBlue flights to Aruba. These digital developments are happening at an accelerated pace. By harnessing the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, we envision a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive Aruba empowering our citizens, cultivating a culture of innovation, expanding on our e-government capabilities, engaging business and civil society towards increased public value creation. Aruba is ready to further innovate, to be a partner as we are open for happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. I really appreciate you joining us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists, Paul. 
Hi, how are you? I, uh, I want to just talk a little bit about Aruba joining the Commons Project Foundation and this major first step. Why is it so important? We're delighted for the collaboration that we've developed with the government of Aruba and with JetBlue uh, as well. What's exciting about Aruba coming on board is the validation of this basic idea, which in order to reopen safely, governments like Aruba need confidence that people coming to their country have been tested and soon have been vaccinated. It's very hard to have the confidence to begin to reopen and allow travel and commerce to resume if you're doubting that a person who says they got tested actually got tested. So the whole idea behind the Common Trust Network is to create an open interoperable network of trusted data sources, credible labs, credible, credible vaccination sites who are either doing the testing or doing administering vaccines that can provide people with the digital credential of that test or vaccination record that they can then carry with me, with them and show when they get on a plane or arrive in a country like Aruba, that they actually did get the test or did get the vaccine that they are expecting. And so Aruba's leadership is critical because it does signal to the world that with the confidence in that those data, in those sorts of health credentials, that's the first step to being able to begin to reopen safely. System of apps out there, what is really needed to achieve harmonization? Well, let's break it down. First is is health data interoperability standards, right? What I call a PCR test or a, a, a Moderna vaccination needs to be the same as, uh, needs to be described in the same way that another entity might. So the first is around harmonizing of health data standards. And the good news is there've been decades of work around harmonization of health data standards. And the Common Trust Network is building on those existing health data interoperability interoperability standards. So that's the first element. The second element is how are those data securely wrapped? It's easy with people who are just showing up with pieces of paper or with handwritten vaccine certificates to, to fake those. So the second element is actually securing that data so it isn't changed. So when someone gets on a plane or enters a country, you can say, this is the same person that actually got that test or got that vaccination. And the third element is actually creating a registry of those trusted data sources. Just having a standard health uh, record using standard formats that's wrapped securely doesn't really matter if you don't know where it came from. So having a registry, knowing what those sources of data are really important to be able to instill confidence in those destinations that they actually can rely uh, on the information to make critically important decisions. Do you address privacy concerns among users if people are concerned that about, you know, sharing this, these medical tests and, and records? By putting the person in control of their information, we don't believe that someone should have to hand over their health information to an airline or a government or anyone else. What they can do, and this is what Common Pass, which is built on top of the Common Trust Network, does is inspects the individual's information that stays securely in their control and just sends a signal to either an airline or to a government that this traveler has satisfied the requirements of the destination. The health data never leaves that individual's control. That's how we're able to protect individual data privacy, but yet give countries, airlines, other travel partners, the confidence that the travelers actually have met their requirements. Thank you, Paul, that's great. That's actually a great segue to Joanna. I want to just, you know, talk to you about the fact that you will be trialing the Common Pass uh, on flights to Aruba with JetBlue. Why do you think this is an important first step in, in restarting travel? Um, thanks, Jackie. And it's great to um, see the Prime Minister of Aruba. We're uh, such a great partner. And thanks for all of your support over the last several months as we navigate this crisis. Um, you know, we're looking at how do we make travel safe, healthy, and easy. And I think the um, patchwork of laws that are coming out and requirements that are coming out that don't um, pay much regard to some of the privacy considerations, but also the accuracy and validity of some of the testing requirements are a concern. And so as we think about the Commons Project and Common Pass specifically, we believe that can take many of those considerations sort of off the table for an airline or for a government, because that's the um, expertise that they have, you know, obviously being founded in sort of a broader health records platform. And so our view is we'd like to plug into the Commons, uh, into, into Common Pass to help 
um, provide that level of security for testing data and eventually vaccine data. And testing data is interesting it comes from labs and labs are uploaded, but vaccines aren't going to necessarily come from labs. Vaccines are going to come from a variety of healthcare providers. So there needs to be some thought, um, assuming that vaccines provide the level of protection we think they will, there needs to be a level of thought around a verifiable vaccine uh, framework as well. And then you and then want you to want make it easy for the customer. You want the customer to understand what the rules are in that specific country. You know, we have a saying, you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. Um, we would love to have a cohesive set of rules around the world, but frankly, I think that's probably unrealistic, at least in the short term. And so having both an engine that explains exactly what the customer needs when they go to that destination and then facilitates that document storage is gonna be critical for customer ease of travel. And then ideally for our crew members, um, you know, we all talk about trying to ensure distancing in airports. Well, when you start introducing, you know, paper attestations and records where um, it communicates your um, COVID status in paper form, that undermines the whole notion of this seamless, um, touch-free airport experience. And so we're also very much focused on how do we protect the health and safety of our own crew members um, so that they don't have to go through a series of documents that frankly may not even be accurate, but more importantly, put them in a situation where they're much closer to customers um, than perhaps at least the CDC guidelines would recommend. I just flew internationally, I full confession, I, I and I found the paper, uh, the showing of the, the COVID testing quite cumbersome, and I can't wait for the day that this is all digital because it will make for a more seamless travel experience. Joanna, can you talk to me a little bit about the CDC requirement for international travelers having to be tested? What impact that is actually having on your business? And I guess this is a two-part question. Uh, if you could give the audience a little bit of a sense of what, what domestic travel is going to be looking like this year and any potential uh, testing requirements, you know, that's been in the news lately as well. Sure, thanks. Um, so the CDC order went into effect on Tuesday. The order provides that for anybody over the age of two, you must produce um, a negative COVID test, a negative molecular test um, taken within 72 hours or three, three calendar days, actually it says three calendar days of travel um, prior to departure. And then you also have to produce an attestation. So a paper attestation where you um, agree that you haven't been exposed to COVID and, and, and aren't positive. That has to be presented at the time of departure. This went into effect on Tuesday. Um, I'd say the first day was a bit bumpy. Um, certain countries like Aruba were extremely prepared uh, for, for this um, and had, I think, sufficient testing capabilities. Other countries were less prepared. You know, we do expect over the coming week or so that um, testing capabilities will scale more quickly. Um, you know, I, I said in our earnings call before, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, you will have a variety of testing um, uh, testing opportunities, whether it's at a hotel, whether it's at the airport, that will scale in the coming weeks. I do think, um, as Paul properly pointed out, though, the validity of that test and how do you protect against fraud is going to be an important um, consideration as we move forward. So I do think, you know, there's a process in place in international to already check documentation. So from that perspective, it adds more time to the process, but, um, but there is already that framework. As we start thinking about domestic, um, there are a number of uh, reports out um, that indicate the CDC is considering putting into place um, testing across the United States domestically interstate. You know, I think this is a new administration. The government is obviously stepping into a world that they're just um, learning, uh, you know, about how um, how good or bad it may be in terms of how prepared we are for vaccination and testing. You know, they're trying to balance um, public health considerations economic recovery. I think we have some real concerns with the domestic testing uh, requirement. I think first uh, and foremost is, you know, frankly, the ability to actually scale testing around the United States. Um, you know, in certain states, testing is working much better than in other states. There are concerns around the turnaround time. Um, in many cases, if you take a, a PCR test, it takes several days to get that back. And we all know that the test is only good for that snapshot in time. Um, you know, U.S. Travel noted that if you start requiring travelers domestically to get tested, that'll be 42% more customers per day. Um, and we, we're real concerned about how that's going to put stress and pressure on an already fragile um, infrastructure. And then I think, given the United States and most of it is, you know, contiguous, how, how do you single out air travel, which has already been determined to be a safe mode of travel? How do you single out air travel compared to other modes of transportation? And does this really accomplish from a risk perspective, 
um, what I think the CDC thinks it, it may accomplish. You know, people are still going to find a way to see mom and dad, um, whether it's taking a plane, a train, a bus. Um, and then, you know, finally, again, there's not, a, there's not a structure in place in our airports to check documentation. Um, you know, we've been very much focused on biometrics, on touchless experience, waving your boarding pass through a um, a, a gate that is not necessarily staffed. And you start introducing paper documentation and, and testing that creates, um, I think, link longer times to board, creates longer times to check. And then frankly, again, puts our people in a difficult spot where not only are they trying to enforce mask wearing and social distancing, but now they're asked to enforce um, enforce testing and then presumably eventually vaccination. So it's something that, you know, we're really encouraging CDC to partner with the industry to understand the operational realities of some of these, um, um, some of these uh, considerations so that we can come up with the right risk-based approach uh, for uh, domestic travel. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I'm going to come back to you in a little bit, but I want to turn things over to the minister, uh, Minister Haji. Thank you for joining us from Canada. So I want, I, if you could walk people through sort of the current protocols and that are in place in Canada right now, people have to, they're required to submit a negative COVID test to enter the country, but there's also a 14 day quarantine requirement. So what are sort of the operational impacts of this policy? And, you know, there are also pilot programs that you're actually testing in certain provinces right now. So I'd love for you to walk the audience through that. Well, thank you very much. And the, I'm finding this conversation fascinating, I have to say. And it's been, as a Minister of Health, one of the most challenging aspects in my role is to try and manage um, from the very beginning what to do with international travel. And we all know that uh, the international health regulations um, were kind of thrown out the window in this regard uh, very early on as countries worked to try and prevent the importation of COVID-19 and did so in varying degrees. I'll, I'll just uh, back up and say, yes, we do have a very rigorous process. I would say one of the more rigorous in the world. The 14-day quarantine is really the only sort of foolproof way to determine whether or not someone actually does have COVID. And we know that the pre-departure testing is a point in time. It is a valuable additional measure to do some screening before someone gets on an airplane. Uh, you know, we do have testing at the border in a number of provinces, uh, voluntary at the moment, which uh, in Alberta at the moment, um, it's around you know, uh, trying to see what the blend of testing and quarantine might be that provides a certain level of comfort around uh, reducing that risk of importation. And there's, you know, varying perspectives around the country about whether or not we need to loosen our measures. And then in some provinces and territories, obviously calls for strengthening of measures. In particular, as we start to see, um, you know, some Canadians continue to travel south, for example, for vacation. I will note that international travel is down by 90 90%, uh, so huge amount of decline in terms of international travel. I guess for Canada, it's around trying to make sure that we control our own domestic epidemic, which we have had a significant second wave. But I'll also say, I think when we're talking about international travel, that confidence, I think, by travelers that when they resume travel, they're going to e be able to travel with a reduced or even a no risk uh, um, sort of scenario of, of, of contracting COVID. COVID-19 is going to be critical to reestablishing um, the industry and international travel. And so the points that I sort of wanted to raise in, in this part of the question is really the need for collaboration. You're hearing a lot in terms of digital tools and what that looks like. I would also say we need to collaborate more as a globe to actually combat the epidemic because in fact, some of the areas where I think Canadians most frequently travel or want to travel or for leisure or for other reasons, um, often there's uncertainty about their own personal safety if they do so. And so this need for a more cohesive approach to um, understanding uh, how we how we combat this epidemic as a globe, I think is critical to the industry. I would also say that um, the polit political reality is significant. I, I mean, governments are under enormous pressure to protect their citizens. The rise of variants, as you know, has created another sort of flurry of conversations around the role of borders, how borders are or aren't effective at uh, preventing viruses from entering countries. And that's at adding additional political pressure to governments around the world to take measures to protect against importation. And I would also say that the important piece um, that I, I think 
as we're talking about sort of fast passes and touchless um, systems and, you know, various different kinds of digital tools, I would also say that the issue of equity is something that we need to kind of keep our mind on, right? Because so much of the travel in Canada is actually about family reunification. It's about people moving around for work and you know, we've got a large sort of uh, group of folks that move for reasons that are not recreational. Um, and so I think we have to sort of stay focused on the equity issue and the systems that we design have to be um, designed through the lens that people uh, from all around the world are going to be able to um, access this in one way or another. And that's where I think the partnership with industry can play a really important role. I think that's equity is hugely important, and I thank you so much for raising that point. With the Alberta pilot program, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the quarantine requirements can be shrunk down to seven days, correct, if people are test negative, um, and then they can go about and resume their businesses. How is that? How has that pilot program been going? So uh, it was actually um, uh, at the conclusion of a first negative PCR test that they could leave quarantine and then begin to move about uh, um, ideally staying within the province of Alberta, although there is no internal mechanisms to stop people if they are going to travel to an adjacent province. Uh, it, it's going okay. I mean, we're still seeing importation rates that I would say it's concerning to, in particular, the provincial authorities, but also to, the, to, to, to our own ministry. Ministry, the Ministry of Health, um, it's not a perfect solution. And I think someone, um, uh, you said maybe, Paul, that, you know, the, the test is really just a point in time. And that's the limitation, right, with PCR tests um, and even the rapid tests is that you are essentially assessing whether a person is infectious at that point in time. And we know that this uh, virus has a long incubation period for some folks and that uh, some folks don't test positive until, you know, day 10 of uh, exposure. So it's been, you know, it's, it's a really, it's a really tricky piece. And I think that's where also, you know, um, industry collaboration, not necessarily travel industry, but potentially um, to accelerate the development of tools that can be used in, in screening capacities would be super helpful. I mean, I think that's one of the uh, areas where quite frankly, we have a sparsity of tools, we've got good diagnostic tools, not such great screening tools. And, you know, screening tools that are fast, that are accurate, that can help, you know, and that are, I would say, economic, economical would be really, really helpful, I think, in terms of countries' response and, and, and I would say, ideally, uh, industry's response as well. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to hand things over to Felipe. Thank you for being so patient. And uh, I want, if you wouldn't mind walking the audience through your role uh, with Airports Council International and really what do you think the single greatest challenge is to restarting travel and tourism and making people feel comfortable in airports flying? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Jacqueline, for, for the question. And thank you, uh, my my. Well, my colleagues here on this panel. It's very interesting to hear from you what is your expectations about the, the, the future of the industry and use of the, the health passes as well. And it's amazing because one year ago when, uh, when I was doing one of my last trips, uh, business trips, uh, we are discussing about the, the, the COVID in Asia, a lockdown in Wuhan, and basically thinking is about another issue that will affect only a part of the world. After that, uh, the, the role turns global, uh, and uh, we are discussing that in September, October of last year, we have uh, the start of recovery of the industry. Uh, after that, that didn't happen. We end up at the end of the year uh, saying that the, the Christmas and New Year will be the recovery of the industry because of the, the time that we already locked down and everything that's happened. And the second wave comes and uh, everything was closed again and the, all the good expectations that we have at the end of the year with the vaccines uh, development comes a little bit uh, uh, down. Uh, we as an ACI world, uh, we, we need to work together and advocate uh, in name of our airports, in name of the, the industry as well, because we believe that the airports, we have our partners, that is a big partners at the airlines, but we have all the tourist, tourist community as well that is linked with us. That's why cruise uh, hotels, uh, business, etc. that are linked with aviation. Aviation is a global business and you cannot really uh, stop to fly nowadays is in a global perspective. Uh, 
uh, in, in here in, in ACI, we are based in Montreal, and uh, Montreal is very well known by the capital of uh, the world of aviation because we have ICAO here, that's International Civil Aviation Organization. We have uh, IATA, this International uh, Air Transport Organization as well. And I think we are willing uh, to collaborate and work together with ICAO in terms of the global standards and, and global perspectives for the industry. I'm very happy to see uh, the, the Minister Haju said that uh, we, we are working for collaboration uh, in work on that. And I think that's the best thing to do. Uh, if we uh, here, based here in Canada, can help uh, with the process, we'll be very happy to do that. And uh, the cooperation in global standards, the cooperation to have a kind of a, a global harmonization of the process will help us uh, to, to get out of this crisis. And uh, vaccines, tests, need to be used as a tool. Uh, there is no way that you have a zero risk, uh, but it is the way that you can work together uh, and have uh, uh, this industry uh, going back on track. Millions of jobs are in, at risk. Uh, the economy downturn as well is at risk and aviation play a key role uh, on this process. What do you see 2021 looking like in terms of recovery? I know it's so hard. This is a moving target as every day changes, but what, what are your goals for this year? Well, um, the industry went down last year in the, in the airports around, we are, we are losing around $112 billion in terms of the, the, the losses for the industry. Uh, we lost around 65% uh, of the global passengers. Uh, and of course, uh, we expected to recover, especially in international traffic, only on 2024, 2025. We are seeing some uh, um, good developments in domestic markets. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, China, India, Brazil, Russia in the domestic markets growing a little bit. That's why we are seeing some recovery on these areas. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to see a recovery from international passengers that is still uh, in a standstill, basically uh, reaching around minus 90, minus 92 percent on international connectivity. And this year will be a very tough, you know, I think the things will get worse before getting better, unfortunately. But we expect that we have uh, from the, 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 the June, July, uh, at least a light of the end of the tunnel with the development of vaccines, with develop the procedures uh, that can be used as tests uh, to reduce uh, the quarantines and, and, of course, and of course, bring the, 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 the public uh, and the, 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 the states uh, the good uh, faith on the, on, on the industry in that we are doing uh, the right thing to recover the process, considering, of course, uh, the epidemiological situation of the countries.